what I'm going to do is a bit of an exercise here. So let's do some teleportation. Let's start by rewinding a little bit. Let's try to go back five years ago in our lives. So literally try to think five years. You can close your eyes if you want. So try to think of where you were, right? Five years ago. It was 2019. It was right before COVID hit. The world was about to change. Everyone looks back at 2019 and we all felt it was the best year ever. So really think about that year and think about what you were doing at that time, what you were, what you were doing work-wise, were you happy, were you in a relationship, were you not, where were you living, so really visualize that, okay? And now hold that thought. So now we're gonna flip that around, we're going to fast forward by five years. So we're going in the future, five years, we're in 2029. Okay, so again, really visualize that. So stand up, look around you, where are you? Are you in Malta? Are you in a different country? Look at yourself physically. What do you look like, right? Have you got that beach body you always wanted to have? <laughs> or have you got more of the dad bod? That unfortunately happens as well. <laughs> so visualize that once again. And now hold on to that thought. So read these words and how does this make you feel? Today the, you're the oldest you've ever been and the youngest you'll ever be. So the reason I wanted to do this talk here today is because these words, the future is now, to me is a very much a mantra that I live by. It wasn't always the case. It's kind of something I've learned along the way. And um, uh, well, the future to me isn't something that's in the distance, a very point in the horizon that's unapproachable and out of reach. But really it feels like it's something that is right here, right now, something we can carve out for ourselves and should start making steps towards achieving. Exactly what Zach said, basically. <laughs> Okay, so I'll be sharing my story today, starting with <laughs> this car. So imagine me, so I'm 23 years old, this is 2005, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, out of university, all excited about what comes next. I inherited this car, it was a hand-me-down, and it was the coolest thing ever. My mom's here, she can attest. I was so happy with this car. It had a double sunroof, 1986 Fiat Panda Fire. Rochelle knows CD player, like back in the day, that was a cool thing. And I love the freedom that this car gave me. It was the first sense of freedom that I ever had as a student, right? The problem was I was doing bar work, having studied for five years, and I couldn't really afford to keep it on the road. So I was speaking to some friends in London at the time, and they were telling me, you know what, there is a solution for everything. You know, in London, there are certain jobs that give you freedom. They give you a free car. They give you a free mobile phone, a free laptop, enough money to buy and rent your own place. I was like, what? Okay, I'm doing this. I was on the first flight to London. <laughs> so this was 2005, and the job that they were talking about was sales, right? Not something I ever dreamt of as a child or had studied to go into sales, but it had all of these perks, and they were undeniable. So I realized I got my first job in sales, and I realized, you know what, I can do this. I'm, I'm okay at selling, I'm quite good at it. I was hitting my target regularly, and then I get promoted to senior sales, and then I'd get a bigger car, and I'd get a newer phone, and I'd get more money, but of course, more pressure. And things were okay so far, we enjoyed it, we enjoyed the climb. I would build a sales track record, which meant that you start to get headhunted. There's a bottleneck between people who can sell and people trying to sell things. So I'd get lots of calls constantly, headhunters offering you some great, glamorous, you know, shiny jobs, and I took a lot of them. So I, I moved around, I went for the better opportunity. I'd sell anything from biometric technology to selling Microsoft products. So it was great, loved it. But at the same time, I was very aware how this made me feel. You know, there was, there was this, this feeling of burnout that started to build up, right? It's, it's a physically tough job. You'd get told, what part of F off don't you understand on the regular, right? So this is your life. But we carried on. So in 2010, I got promoted to global head of business development, and I got promoted to launch the magazine I was working for. Um, uh, in the US and start and, and launch into a brand new marketplace. This was a time after the 2008 crash when the world was very competitive, right? To get back on their feet and start making money. This was San Francisco, Palo Alto, Steve Jobs were all at their peak. So I felt like, you know what, I'm a small town girl in Malta, here I am in San Francisco, this is great. 
In my first two months there, I would travel to about six or seven different states, new business meetings, pitching to clients, and um, hitting my targets. So I hit my target on the third month, and this isn't a brag fest, by the way. This is not <laughs> at all what I'm trying to do here, because a lot of this is about what I felt I had to do and what I wanted to do, because that's what I felt was going to give me the freedom that I wanted. But at the end of the day, I was ignoring something very big. That was the burnout that I was feeling. This was a time when mental health awareness wasn't really spoken about. We don't talk about these things. You know, you just deal with these things down the pub, basically. <laughs> so you just go on, on a night out and you just, you know, trash it out. So we are in at the end of 2010, and the only way really that I would do something about this and change this trajectory I found myself on, a little bit stuck, was by receiving a phone call. And unfortunately, it was a dreaded phone call that I think all of us who've ever lived away would always worry about getting, and that's a phone call from your parents, basically. So my dad was a free-spirited architect. He was very passionate about sailing. He was a doting um, father to me, and he was the, the life of the party. He seemed to have he would be the master of his own universe all the time. He had this sense about him. But unfortunately, in 2011, I got the call to tell me that his cancer had come back and it had spread. So obviously, this is when I left San Francisco. Life as I knew turned black. I just came back home. And I, by the time I had arrived here, in fact, he had already been starting chemo, who is in hospital. So there I go, you know, expecting to see him all miserable and sad. But he wasn't. I'd see him, I'd go and see him in the ward. And there he is, all bright-eyed, telling stories about his adventures and his near misses in life. And he seemed to have this spirit about him that wasn't what traditionally I would have expected, right, from someone with cancer. So this whole battle of with cancer, which is more like a phase in, in his life, lasted eight years. So this whole eight years, he would always see himself as a filfla, right? So the island, standing alone, feeling like it can withstand any storm that life threw at him. He'd stand tall, he'd survive it, he'd come out stronger. That was his attitude. So I had to ask him, so, pa, like, why do you have, <laughs> how is it that you think so differently than uh, any other people? This is like hardcore stuff, right? And he told me, oh yes, Chris, because um, in when I was younger, I read, this article about people at their deathbed. And uh, somebody published a study about the five most common regrets that people felt when they were on their way out. So he very much used these five regrets as a tool to live his life today, which I was blown away by. So these five regrets are, I wish I had the courage to live authentically. So people wish they had done things rather than regretting doing the things that they had already done, right? They regretted not doing, not what they did, which I found quite interesting. Wish they hadn't worked so hard, had the courage to express their feelings, had stayed in touch with friends, or let themselves be happier. So this was an eye-opener to me. Um, it changed my life, actually, hearing someone tell me these things, because I, I, didn't, I didn't look in words before. It wasn't, I was always, you know, you, you get university, you just do things, but for this, moment, I stopped and I looked inward and I started asking myself questions. So these questions to me are very fundamental and they're questions that I ask myself regularly in life and not just once. So they are, in reality, am I living a life true to myself? What gives purpose and meaning to my life? So how do I define happiness and success? And by that definition, how would I score, right? So also, the big one, if today was my last day, how would I live it? Would I have any regrets? So these questions were very front of mind, and this led me to my wedding day, to my beautiful husband, Keith, there, let's point. <laughs> so 2014 was a crazy year. It was a year full of dualities and extremes to me. It's the year I, met my, I married my soulmate. But it's also the year I lost my father, who, as you can see, I'm holding his hand in this photo, not my husband's, because he actually passed away three weeks later. So it was all very close. But it's also the year good things happened to me, because, besides my husband, because I also found my purpose, something that I hadn't really thought about before. So we're in this phase, 
And this, these questions led me to think to myself, surely I can do something a bit more purposeful with my time, right? So I decided to hang up the hat on sales, and I decided to now trade my business skills to actually give back, to raise and generate money for charities, for good causes, and actually make a difference in life. To me, doing this was actually healing. I needed some soul nourishment. I was devastated, as you can imagine, after losing a parent. So my, my light at the end of the tunnel really was giving back, selflessly being altruistic and using my channeling what I could do to help others. So this is when, my, when I moved from sales to fundraising. And in my first year, um, I raised over a million pounds for um, uh, good causes, which gave me the reward better than any other bonus or a fancy car could have given me. It was that important um, feeling, so I, I could actually do this. And then my job at the time was so from pitching in sales and corporate partnerships. Now I was pitching to those corporates, right? So I'm asking them on behalf of the charity, asking them to donate to our, you know, sa life-saving cause and um, uh, make a difference through their CSR programs. So that's how I pitched and raised that one million. But one of my clients was actually the CEO of the Smiley Company. <laughs> and um, so he was at the time, so he came on board as our partner, but it was an interesting time for him because, so he ha had hunted me after this, and he said that he was also looking to set up his own NGO. He's been looking for someone, they didn't know how to make it work, blah, blah, blah. So he sold the idea to me to help him launch this NGO whereby we could help hundreds of charities um, uh, and uh, really help all of these create a platform for change, a platform for good. So I thought, obviously, and all while working from Malta, by the way, so working remotely, that was a big one. So, of course, loved the idea, using the smiley face as a beacon of hope and optimism and then actually backing that up with the resources to be able to fund good causes. So in the six years that I was there, we helped over 300 charities and we gained on a social media following of half a million followers. We put on 60 talks just like this with panelists and planned and delivered and launched and negotiated the contract of these charity film awards. So these awards and this whole smiley movement, which is what we called it, started off as a small you know, one, two people person team working from a little rented office, a small office and, and putting on events in church halls with my mother-in-law, um, uh, preparing sandwiches for our guests. So it was all, it was humble, it was from the heart, it was authentic. But we managed to grow and, you know, through putting on these events, grow our audience. And, and that was obviously quite, quite an it felt like quite an achievement. So fast forward here, so this is me standing outside the Odeon Leicester Square, which is where we put on the, these charity film awards, this event. So this was a huge event. So we had record numbers, we had 900 people who had bought the tickets to show up. We had guest speakers, we had BBC, we had ITV in the audience. We had, I had struck a deal with TikTok to donate, to be our partners and donate half a million to the charities that we were working with through um, advertising credit. So this should have been the, the highlight, right, of my life. Like I told myself, I wanted to work for good causes. This is going to give me purpose. So I'm standing there, I'm watching people starting to show up. But for some reason, I'm not happy. So for some reason, there was a disconnect. I felt empty and I just felt, what's going on here? So I started to ask, why? So after some, some soul searching and time traveling later, I realized and I learned that I had evolved. I wasn't the same person in 2005 that I am now. I always had a growth, growth mindset, but my definition of success had changed very much. In 2005, I was a money-hungry student, um, dying for a taste of freedom, so my career and um, professional growth were the number one goal for me. And then, obviously, the turning point in 2005, after the, that crazy year that I had the year before, it was all about finding purpose, finding meaning, what's fulfilling, and then finding a way to give back. So I did, did that for a while, but then it got to 2023, which is the previous slide, and I realized to myself, but what is it? What's missing? And really, the what, what we don't say, right, when we're talking about the successful story, is the number of hours and migraines and you know the pain that went into organizing all of those events. And after spending six years working 
um, behind my desk, I started to realize that I don't want to do this anymore. What I really need for me is to listen, to go inside and actually do something that's going to make me feel alive again. So that at the time, my priorities had shifted. My priorities at this point was freedom, right? Freedom to make choices for my own work, freedom to use all the skills I had adopted and learned in these past 20 years and be self-employed and, you know, being more in control of my own destiny, as well as freedom to go sailing, to live on a boat, to put your house on Airbnb and live more of a life of adventure, be more free and live feeling more fulfilled because that suddenly was my measure of success. So it's okay to evolve, it's just kind of have a minute to ask yourself those questions and then appreciate them. So the point here is, um, so life isn't about the pursuit of happiness, but the happiness of pursuit. And to me, this very much is it. It's all about the ride sometimes. Stop and, and appreciate and enjoy that getting there isn't the main prize, but the lessons and the stories that come out of the hardship and the ups and the downs are actually what make it wo more worthwhile. So closing off, um, uh, this is what I, th I think is a very wise um, lesson. You can't control the wind, but learn to adjust your sails. And it's very much about a kind of a metaphor for life where you, in my case, I very much always had these clear goals and thought to myself that, you know, work hard, get to the goals, and then you're going to be happy. But then at the end of the day, you know, life throws, you know, segues at you or different wind sides. So it's very much very important about adjusting and learning how to adapt, plan for change, you know, plan things, things are going to happen. And closing slide, very much, don't wait until it's too late to figure out what makes you happy. The future is now, the future is yours. Go get it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.